Our third speaker at the MACNA 2020 online seahorse and pipefish event was Tammy Wise. Tammy describes herself as a seahorse nerd, and while she is, she's so much more. After years of working with her own signathids and attending events like Singbio and MBI, Tammy created a website called FuseJaw.com and a Facebook group called Seahorses and Pipefish. Her presentation today covers not only feeding seahorses properly, but choosing the right foods. Let's jump right in. Hi guys, um, I wanted to thank Kelly for wrangling me. Um, I, it's been a chaotic, it's been a chaotic year, chaotic couple of weeks, chaotic couple of days. Um, but I think what I kind of want to talk about is just overall, like uh, Felicia touched on it, and you know Chad went into some of it about feeding our seahorses because it is such an important thing that there's areas that we're still there's that we struggle with still. Um, and before I get too much into this, I actually wanted to thank Dan Underwood uh, of Seahorse Source. The whole, my whole obsession with kind of getting this right with seahorse foods came from Dan a few years back, probably more than a few years back saying, I think you're storing your food wrong. And that had me of course going, that can't be right, but I should look into it. And he was right. Um, you know, and one of the things that came out of it was just how, unstable like our frozen foods can be which is what our seahorses rely on you know like the many things that um seahorse that are unique to to signathids and seahorses is you know we're kind of in this place where we have to feed frozen and frozen is a more convenient step than how you used to feed them which was using live foods um but the downside is is that a lot of the things that seahorses need um, are not very stable even while frozen. Like uh, we feed mice as shrimp, but we don't necessarily feed it because it's a complete diet. We feed it because it's easy and seahorses will take it. Like a lot of seahorses need that trigger. They need to see like eyes. I'm sure many of you have seen this in action where a seahorse won't touch something unless it has eyes. Um, I, I've, I've thought many times, man, if I could make an artificial seahorse food that had you know, somehow eyes painted on them isn't practical, but if you could do that, I swear you'd get them to eat. Um, you know, so it's, Mysis has allowed us to keep seahorses and has allowed people who are not necessarily on the coast or who wouldn't have time to um, feed our seahorses the, if we had to be constant, constantly collecting live food. But there are some downsides to it. Um, one of it is, just that it's a single food. And if you look at the different foods that seahorses eat in the wild, um, you know, I've looked at a few different papers on gut content analysis, and it's such a wide variety of, um, of uh, crustaceans that they eat. You know, mysis are in there, um, but you're also going to have, you know, larval um, crustaceans, you're going to have amphipods, isopods. Uh, one that surprised me a lot was copepods, even in adult seahorses, because, you know, in a home aquarium, you don't really see them going after um, uh, copepods much, but in the wild, some species that actually makes up a decent part of their diet, even if you were able to get them to eat that consistently in captivity, you would end up having to feed so many that, you know, um, Chad's business wouldn't know what to do with themselves. So I, I look at seahorse feeds and I go, you know, there's stuff that we're doing and there's things that we should do better. Um, the other thing to know about seahorse diets is that they do tend to need a lot of fat in their diet. They have these short digestive tracts. Um, and Felicia talked a little bit about the fact that their gut associated lymphoid tissue is missing. Um, they actually had a longer digestive tract and just through evolution and basically the lack of need of fighting off bacteria, they lost that when they shortened their digestive tract or when evolution shortened it for them. Um, the whole point of kind of that gut associated lymphoid tissue is to basically protect against uh, like punctures. Um, if you have animals that are eating each other and chewing the another smaller animal up, it might get a bone or a scale lodged in its stomach, which is where bacteria can enter. 
you can see horses because they kind of pulverize their food when they're eating. They don't necessarily have that need. So they just evolve to eat very small objects, pulverize them, uh, and pass the digestive system fast. They, what they do eat um, tends to be very high in fat, specifically omega-3 fatty acids. And this kind of is where it comes back to mysis. So we have mysis available, they're easy to get, but omega-3 fatty acids are fairly unstable. Um, and the problem is even while frozen, they're unstable. So you end up having a very short window of time where they start to degrade. And when they degrade, they end up uh, becoming basically, uh, the, some of them uh, become free radicals. Um, and the other problem is that they're not always handled very well, either getting to the fish store or at the fish store. I mean, it, we were talking about, and Felicia had some of the pictures of the, the kind of brown or colored mysis. That mysis is, um, it's basically a form of, uh, it's either non-enzymatic browning or lipid uh, peroxidation, which is basically that fatty acid breaking down. That can happen from being handled poorly, but it also can be happen from being frozen um, just over a long enough period of time. Like in food health, you shouldn't have frozen food more than, um, a frozen shrimp more than six months. There isn't really a recommendation for seahorses, but and so that six months time is at negative, uh, 30 degrees Celsius, which is negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. And no, I'm not that good at math. I looked it up beforehand because I couldn't remember. Um, so we have this situation where we've got a food that's readily available to them, but it's not necessarily a complete diet and it's very unstable. Um, it's something that I myself hadn't really found a solution to. Now, just so you all know, I'm actually not keeping seahorses right now. I got rid of... Um, all my fish at the beginning of 2019 because I'm back in school. Um, and as much as I love, uh, as much as I love fish, that's the problem. I would do all fish and not my schoolwork. Um, so I was struggling with trying to figure out how to deal with this. And, you know, one of the big things is making sure that you have fresh mice. You know, you'll see that it'll be a whiter color. Um, the brown color usually is a sign of something either in handling being wrong. It's hard to say for sure because one of the things in talking to a few different food manufacturers is they would claim that it's based more on the systems and the water quality when they were collecting it. The problem is, is it's, it's a difficult thing to test. Um, there are ways of testing it, but it's definitely not something that's typically tested. So we only can infer that the browner mysis is bad because it definitely turns brown as it goes bad, but it's possible that there are other things. Um, the other issue is that we have to make sure that it's collected within a reasonable amount of time. Um, some of the collectors don't collect it uh, like multiple times a year. They might collect once a year. Well, if you're only supposed to keep shrimp frozen, at the ideal temperature for six months, but the uh, manufacturer is only collecting once a year. That means the back half of the year is going to be um, basically mice that you don't want to feed. Um, and so again, this is something that I struggled with trying to figure out what to do. You know, I treated after kind of figuring out a lot of this, reading about food handling. I tried to make sure that. I was always keeping things in like a deep freeze freezer. I had one that didn't get quite to the negative 22 Fahrenheit, but it got to around negative 20. Um, and I would only keep it for a certain period of time. I was very picky about how it looked from the beginning. I wouldn't take it from any manufacturers or brands that sent it like with ice instead of dry ice. Because a lot of times it'd be kind of soft and flexible, still cold, still frozen, but not enough. Um, so that's kind of where I've been with, you know, one of the problems. Uh, I would always thought in 
um, cold water that I kept in the fridge and I would use um, vitamin C because vitamin C is an antioxidant which will slow the breakdown of your omega-3 fatty acids uh, and never keep it in the fridge more than a day. So I would thaw it in the fridge, then feed it out, you know, maybe feed the second feeding in the evening with that. That was one of the solutions that I had. Um, it, it really was a lot of making sure that you're handling this very well. Um, I was always trying to figure out what else to feed. Like there were some frozen um, larger copepods, like arctopods that I, I liked. Um, cyclopes uh, were great. And this is the other side of the coin is making sure that you're feeding um, uh, foods with like antioxidants uh, and carotenoids, uh, such as like astaxanthin, astaxanthin, astaxanthin being the big one. I had the ability to get a lot of adult brine shrimp for fairly cheap. And this goes out to Ray J, because Ray J, and I'm sure many of you know him, had pointed out that brine shrimp in and of itself isn't that bad as long as you enrich it. So I always tried to make sure that I would also feed that because unlike frozen mysis where you might try and get foods to stick or like supplements to stick to the top, you can actually feed it to the brine shrimp. Um, and so what I would do is either, you know, use astaxanthin powder um, or I was a big fan of, uh, ooh, what was it called? Algamac, um, Algamac 3050, I believe, but it was a type of uh, dried algae that was really high in DHA, um, which is one of the omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and then I actually got into feeding a lot with um, live phytos because you, your live phytos will have a lot of the carotenoids, but they'll have a lot of other um, phytonutrients that you may not necessarily see in um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, you may not see in like just a, a refined powder or, or something to that effect. So plus I also really enjoy growing the different phytos. Um, so these are kind of the areas that I was focusing on with food. Now, one of the things that I discovered just kind of through running um, a website and being involved in, you know, this community of, of you know, seahorse keepers online is that a lot of people did have problems getting their hands on mice that wasn't brown. And I wish I knew a solution for that. Um, and the problem is, is that there are some like long-term effects of this. And Felicia had mentioned very briefly um, that, you know, weak SNP can be caused by like a vitamin E deficiency. And what she's referring to is nutritional myopathy. Now the vitamin E deficiency might not be exactly vitamin E being missing from their diet, but rather when those omega-3 fatty acids start to break down, they become um, free radicals. And those free radicals start to scavenge things like uh, vitamin E. So you may have mice that you're feeding out that ends up being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That ends up being essentially something that will kind of attack the, the tissues and, and the, the in the seahorse itself, if not in the food. And now weak snip is a little weird. It's something that is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Because seahorses have a fairly unique feeding structure uh, in their jaw, it just, there's a lot, a lot of things that can injure it, which is why there seems to be nutritional myopathy, which myopathy just being like um, your loss of muscle or you know a muscle pathology. Um, there's, you know, a presumed ciliates because freshwater dips seem to improve the condition. I know that thyroid has been implicated in it. Um, so there's all these things that can come from feeding this mysis that's a little bit older. Um, and the, the difficult part is that it's not going to directly, you're not going to feed it once and then you're going to have your seahorses die. I've seen people attribute that to the food and I, it might be possible from some other reason, but rather this is something that'll happen over time. And my strong suspicion is, is it also seems to vary with different species because people seem to see it more in like hippocampus reed eye. My personal theory is that they don't get enough astaxanthin in their diet on just uh, mysis shrimp, like because there does seem to be quite a bit of variation in 
what the different species eat, it's possible that maybe in the wild they would get foods higher in different estazanthins and other antioxidants. I don't know. That's a guess on my part. Um, so those were some of my concerns, you know, and I sound obsessive about mysis, but it really is something that, not that we shouldn't feed it, but we should be trying to work on what else we can feed, being very careful when we do um, feed our mysis to make sure that it is fresh. Uh, the expiration dates on the packages are not necessarily accurate to when we would want to feed our seahorses. Like a lot of manufacturers will have expiration dates out two and three years. Rather, what I would say is look at that expiration date as the date that those shrimp are likely harvested and frozen, and then make sure that you go um, no more than six months from that date as when it's fresh. And this goes back to like, what do you do about the manufacturers that uh, collect once a year? Don't get that for the last half of the year. Um, Hikari, at least back, you know, a year or two ago was kind of like my preference because Hikari would collect multiple times a year. Um, and I remember at, uh, it was either Sing Bio or the Sea Dragon Symposium, there were some nutritional profiles and it seemed like Hikari was the best in terms of kind of like your um, EPA and DHA ratio. I also like to feed out um, small krill, um, I forget which species of krill, but a couple um, frozen food manufacturers had one of the smaller species of krill available. And that's because it had a lot of um, estesanthin in it, which is what gave it the bright color. So my assumption and hope was that it would end up being that there'd be less degradation of your um, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I also, honestly, if I were like, if I, I would never, I'm not in this position, but I would love to see people feed more live food. I know people worry about, um, feeding, uh, what's you want to call it? Um, like the seahorse is reverting back to only wanting live food. I think that only happens when the seahorses aren't doing so great health wise. I'm sure there are cases where it does happen, but I really, in my experience, it's always been the seahorses that are not already not doing well or already not healthy that are much more likely to only want something that triggers those feeding instincts because it's live, it's moving, it's got the eyes. Um, and I'm trying to I'm trying to look, figure out what else I can cover here because there's actually a lot here um, in terms of feeding. I think my main message is, you know, be vigilant when you're feeding your seahorses, you know, really try and find manufacturers that will, um, uh, you know, have recently, um, recently uh, collected mysis frozen very well, buy from places that use um, dry ice. If your seahorse will take it, uh, Larry's Reef Frenzy was actually really great. And he's really good with um, feeding or how they handle their frozen. I really wish we'd do single item foods. Um, and then try and just vary their diet. You know, even if it takes a little bit of training, definitely get them eating more foods, more foods with astaxanthin and other carotenoids. Um, I would say get some copepods in there because even if it's not a large part of their diet, it will, you know, they may be eating stuff you're not seeing. You can get them eating amphipods. I wish amphipods in a smaller size were an easier to get frozen food. Um, and again, just, just watch your diet with them. If you can feed live occasionally, you know, handle your frozen like it's going to, you know, degrade because it will. Um, if you can keep it in like a chest freezer as opposed to your fridge or freezer, that would be the way to go. Um, and yeah, get astaxanthins in their diets. I think that's everything. Okay, well, I'm gonna first give you the clap. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. I mean it. Is there a, an important difference in term of nutrition between freshwater and saltwater mysis? So I can answer that, yes. Um, you're gonna see a higher EPA um, profile with freshwater than 
uh, DHA. And with marine fish, you definitely want to have a higher DHA to EPA ratio. So I think I did actually see uh, someone asked about PE versus Hikari. And PE is great for fattening them up. It's great for conditioning them. But because that higher uh, EPA to DHA ratio, it's either higher or it's equal where Hikari is going to have a higher DHA to EPA. Um, Hikari is actually going to be much better. You might for in the short term do real well to use the PE to fatten up the thin seahorse or to get some condition for breeding. But overall, Hikari and saltwater and brackish mysis is going to be better. If you're interested in more of the question and answer section, we'll be releasing a full podcast version. Subscribe to the Seahorse Whisperer on YouTube to find out when it's released. Thank you again to Cute Companies LLC, Paula Carlson, U.S. Mycids, Reef Nutrition, Harkins Aquatics, and Algae Barn for sponsoring this event. And thank you to Felicia, Chad, and Tammy for their wonderful presentations. And of course, thank you to Magna and Mazna for holding this event. But most importantly, thank you to you who come to the event every year to share, learn, and grow the community. We couldn't do it without you, and we can't wait to see you next year.